welcome. Today we are going to address some early patristic thinkers, most notably Saint Justin Martyr, sometimes referred to as Justin the Philosopher, and Saint Irenaeus. After this, there will be a little bonus for those of you who are interested in some brief discussions on other patristic thinkers that led to the size and scope and shape of philosophy throughout the medieval era and even till today. Now, I know many of you were thinking, patristic thought, why are we spending time addressing this in a class on philosophy? While Justin Martyr is sometimes referred to as Justin the philosopher, is that grounds enough to bring it into a class on great thinkers of philosophy where our time is so little? Doesn't this seem much more matters of faith than matters of reason? And therefore, shouldn't that be left for a theology class and not something that's really directed and focused on philosophers? What you're asking is a very old and simple question. Going back to Tertullian, if not earlier than that, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? What does philosophy have to do with faith? These major cities kind of exemplifying this in the minds of Tertullian and others who many of which were rejecting Athens for Jerusalem, and yet others that would use Athens to support Jerusalem. And this is the discussion and the debate that we're having. What does Justin Martyr and Saint Irenaeus have to do with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle? In some words, nothing. In other words, a whole heck of a lot. It really depends on how you'd like to approach the issue. There really is no fundamental difference between Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeus, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, at least not in a broadly conceived understanding of these great thinkers that shape philosophy and how we should approach that, this topic. Not only do we have a clear line of thought connecting Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeus to Bonaventure and Aquinas, but the same questions that are asked by Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeus, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, Bonaventure, Aquinas, Augustine, and a whole host of others are the same questions that our early modern philosophers were addressing. The debate of what can be known and why we can know it exists for all of these great men, and it's the same question throughout all of that. Not just what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem, but what is it that I can know, even to this modern day? And what do we do with that? How do we move forward? The worldviews have changed. Justin Martyr saw the world very different than Solzhenitsyn. But philosophy, the basic process, has not changed. While Marx and Kant would have disagreed, as did already evidenced with discussions we had between Descartes and Hume and Locke and Berkeley, and Hegel saw himself as a corrective, Sartre saw himself in many ways as a corrective to Kierkegaard, whose theistic existentialism was directly at odds with what we would see later with Nietzsche. And our pragmatists are telling us that we need to accept truth for today and then be willing to call it falsehood for tomorrow. But all of these philosophers love wisdom. They're all seeking what they can know and why they can know it. They're all trying to understand the ground to which wisdom can let them move forward. Some of this, the worldview, starts with issues of faith. And the what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Athens supports Jerusalem. Others reject the idea of faith at all. Therefore, Jerusalem must make way to Athens. But all of them are doing the same thought project. All of them, regardless if their theology is based on personal revelation from God or just what they can observe from the world around them, want to know what is the truth. And what do you do with that truth? Is it something that's here today and gone today? 
Is it something that's lasted for eons and will continue to last? All of these thoughts from all of these men can be found guilty of corrupting the youth as happened with Socrates. All of them want to know how you are to live ethically based on what it is that you can know for certain and what gives you that basis. So it's important to address different people from different eras and different locations with different expectations because they're all asking these same questions. What can be known? What is reasonable for me to believe? And based on what I assume to be true, be it from the basis of other philosophers, my own speculation about the universe, or what I believe is found through scripture, faith, and tradition, all of them want to know what they're supposed to do and how they are supposed to navigate this world moving forward. Patristic Christianity is really the basic of medieval philosophy. The philosophy of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, the academy that was set up by Plato, the engagement within Athenian society about these philosophical concepts, had all begun to wane. A few hundred years after the death of Aristotle, the questions that really dominated philosophical thought was practical ones. Logic is great and the ethics is fantastic and the doctrine of the golden mean works out really well in addressing a lot of issues, but how does that help me today in overcoming the struggles that I have? What do I do with this moving forward? Other philosophical systems will rise up. Philosophies of life, such as Stoicism and Epicureanism. Christianity is one of these philosophies of life that emerges after the time of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. It's a philosophy of life that answered these questions of how are you supposed to live and what basis you have for knowing what's true. The ground and the basis for this era of philosophy are known as the writings of the fathers or the patristics at this point. Generally speaking, the patristic Christianity and patristic philosophy and theology and everything else along these lines begins around the year 100. We could probably push this date a little bit earlier if we would like to 70 AD with the fall of the temple. But at this point, you have the completion of all of the texts of the New Testament. The Gospels are written, the Epistles are written, and what is assumed to be the basis for how you're going to proceed is held largely in common. The era of the patristics sometimes ends with the Fourth Ecumenical Council, that of Chalcedon in 451, or some will push it back into the 8th century. Larger issues arise between the Western Church and a greater division between the East and West starts to form, and that consensus of thought is starting to break down by the 8th century. Again, not on basic theological issues, but practical and pastoral concerns. Relations overall on different halves of the empire start to break down. For instance, Pope Constantine visited Constantinople the very last time in 710, a feat that wasn't repeated again until 1967, or the ending of the last truly ecumenical council of Nicaea in 787, when icons were restored amongst other issues were addressed. By the end, of the 8th century, the year 800, Charlemagne is named the new Roman Emperor of the new Holy Roman Empire, which really didn't sit well with the Emperor of Rome, who didn't have Rome but had new Rome, and they viewed themselves as Romans. So the patristic period is definitely done by the year 800. There's other further discussion on divisions of this period. Usually those before and after the first Council of Nicaea in 325. You have those which lived before and wrote before and those who lived after uh, and are in writing largely in response to 
the debates of the empire in the day and based upon the foundation of what the first broadly ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea, addressed and laid down as fundamentals of the faith. Other divisions may occur, those who speak Greek and those who speak Latin, divisions and discussions that happen in the East and the West. Some voices ring a little bit louder in one side of the empire than they do in the other. Augustine is far more important in the West than he is in the East. The same is true as far as the importance of different philosophical works and texts engagement with Aristotle continued in the East while it largely kind of faded away in the West until it was rediscovered with enthusiasm. And by the way, we shouldn't think of the East being settled in Jerusalem at this point either. We have Constantinople and largely the biggest city where this was being discussed was Alexandria. The patristic period really emphasized the what of Christianity, the rational, philosophical, and theological foundations for what it meant to be a Christian, and as such provided the basis of what counted as rational and philosophical and theological for all of those discussions that happened afterwards. Our understanding of not only medieval, but early modern and modern philosophy is the result not of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, but the discussions of what was important for early patristic Christianity. What was important for early patristic Christianity was statements of doxa, the teachings, understanding what is authoritative and what's not, and why something is authoritative and why something wouldn't be. Christianity early on developed very different from most other religions, if we'd like to use that word, uh, of the world all around us. Most religious traditions, faith traditions, etc. Uh, again, this word is a little squishy depending on how you'd like to use it in what academic setting. But most of which care fairly little for doxa as they care far more for praxis. What's important is not that you understand what you're doing, but that you do it. There's not this large debate in the same way that exists within one tradition kind of splintering with another, and at the same time also mediating the broader world all around them. Christianity had this, and so the perseverance and the protection of what was seen as sacred doxa, sacred teachings, was essential for early Christian formation. Even more than anything else, Christianity also held to notions of truth claims. Again, this isn't just the teachings of some important people, but was attached with the idea of the divinity itself. The divine logos, the divine wisdom and teaching is what became embodied and walked amongst them. If indeed there's an incarnation of the logos, wisdom and truth must be preserved. Early Christians were also facing persecution. Not only did they have to justify their ideas to those who shared a basis for how they would view the world, but they had competing rival cults within the Roman Empire that Christianity had to be explained to. Christianity had to be something that made sense, and it had to be something that you'd be willing to die for, because early Christianity is a group that's facing constant persecution. They're largely being persecuted because they don't subscribe to emperor worship. They're not a real religion in the eyes of Rome. They're not Jewish with any contractual obligations, nor are they Roman or pagan. And really, they're not Roman enough for early Roman Empire. They're believed that they're cannibals or engaged in drunkenness or killing babies and drinking their blood, all of which are based on attacks that 
Christians want to hold the notion of truth over and against, saying, no, 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 these are not true. No, they did worship a different god than the Romans, so they were atheists in this way. And they did discuss things about their citizenship being elsewhere. They would also proselytize a whole heck of a lot, spreading this word and would often use the cause of their martyrdom as the center stage to spread this message. Some of which will emerge as confessors uh, of the faith and survive, some of which will die, but all of which are trying to address how what they believe is real and rational and is worth the sacrifice that they are undergoing. The greatest of these early Christian martyrs was none other than Justin Martyr. The name indicates his fate and, and his role there. He's also referred to sometimes as Justin the Philosopher, which should help us understand the connection that he has to philosophy. He was born around the year 100 AD, had Greek parents, and lived in Flavia Neapolis. This happens to be a city in northern Palestine, which had plenty of Jews and Greeks all around, and Christianity was growing and spreading during his life. But he was a good Greek. He studied Greek philosophy. He really liked the arguments of Plato and was engaged in Platonic thought. Once while upon the seashore in solitude, he came upon an old man. We don't know anything more than the fact that he was an old man. And they struck up a conversation. And Justin was talking about how much he enjoyed Plato. And the old man said, have you encountered the prophets of the Old Testament who foretold about Christ? And Justin said, no, <laughs> I have no clue what you're talking about. He's a young man in his late twenties at this point. Uh, and begins to do some study, begins to look through the Old Testament scriptures and New Testament claims and converts over to Christianity, not because it's an issue of faith, but because he saw this as rational and an expression of true philosophy. He did this at about the age of 30. He believed that he could hold both Christianity and philosophy together and that Christianity was itself the true philosophy. He will spend the rest of his life as an apologist, writing to pagans and Jews for the next 35 or so years, explaining that Christianity is indeed true philosophy. One of his more famous discussions was his dialogue to Hepa the Jew, uh, and this discussion was addressed trying to show the rationality of Christianity to a Jewish audience and tried to demonstrate this connection to the Old Testament. The other works he has are addressed to Greeks and trying to preserve or define or defend Christianity as an apologist, as a philosopher, as somebody who's loving wisdom and what he saw to be true. In his discourse to the Greeks, Justin says, do not suppose, you Greeks, that my separation from your customs is unreasonable and unthinking, for I found in them nothing that is holy or acceptable to God. Now we should notice at the very beginning here, his discussion starts off with what is reasonable or the practice of somebody who is a thinking person. This is the basis for why he's going to defend what he defends, argue what he wants to support, because he believes that it is reasonable and therefore the rational thing for any thinking person to do. It says, anyone who becomes a scholar of your most eminent instructor is more beset by difficulties than all men besides. Who is this instructor? It's not Socrates, it's not Plato, it's not Aristotle but largely is the works of Homer. 
the culture that the Greeks practice is one that follows the writings of Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey, etc. He says, of such virtue I am not covetous that I should believe in these myths of Homer. Your public assemblies, he says, I have come to hate. Why? Why does he hate their public assemblies? As you read this work, you see, he says, because they're not logical. They're not consistent. They don't match the world that you see around you. Again, this is somebody who had studied philosophy and, and is navigating this and discussing this. It says, with such a mass of evils, do you banish shame? And you fill your minds with them and are carried away by intemperance and indulge a common practice in wicked and insane fornication. Right? Your actions don't show temperance, yet what do you see as far as the major philosophies that are circulating amongst the Greeks? You're either engaged in the revelry that he is attacking here, or, or you advocate for notions of temperance, as does the Stoics and Epicureans. And he says, then you fail to do your dignity. Your duty to be temperate is gone. The dignity that you have in being man is gone. He then pushes on and attacks the dignity of the Greek gods themselves. He says, and this further I would say to you, why are you, being a Greek, indignant of your son when he imitates Jupiter and rises against you and defrauds you of your own wife? If you look at the things that the gods did, they're reprehensible. And these are the kings of the gods. These are people that you theoretically should want to emulate. And yet, if any of your sons were to do what your gods are doing, he says, then you would feel shamed and be upset about this. Why do you count him your enemy and yet worship one that is like him? And why do you blame your wife for living in unchastity and yet honor Venus with shrines? If indeed these things had been related by others, they would have been seen to be mere scandalous accusations and not truth. Right? The, the very basis and foundation for your religious life is scandal. It's not based on truth or reason. And it's not something that you'd want emulated. But now, he says, your own poets sing these things and your histories noisily publish them. We are called to be rational creatures, and Greek myths are not rational. Christianity is. Here we see his work as an apologist at the very beginning. Look, look what you're doing. Is this rational? Is this consistent with what you yourself expect to see of the world? And if it's not, then isn't it your duty to abandon it for something else? Because for our own ruler, the divine word, who even now constantly aids us, does not desire strength of body and beauty of feature, nor yet the high spirit of earth's nobility, but a pure soul fortified by holiness and the watchwords of our king, holy actions, for through the word, power passes into the soul. If you want true power, it's going to be found within holiness, is what Justin's advocating. Furthermore, speaking to the issues of those passions, those natures that you find within yourself, which push and pull you one way or the other, these things that are contrary, or at least make the virtues difficult, Justin says, the word drives the fearful passions of our sensual nature from the very recesses of our soul. You want a philosophy that's going to address the issues of life, once again, look to Christianity, not Epicurus or Stoicism. First, driving forth lust, through which every ill is begotten, hatred, strife, envy, emulations, anger, and the such. Lust being once banished, the soul becomes calm and serene, and being set free from the ills in which it has sunk up to the neck, it returns to him who made it. For it is a fit that it is to be restored to that state once it is departed, once every soul was or is. That the issues of what we're wanting and what our desires are, 
is only going to be found with a philosophy of life that adequately addresses the roots of these passions and is going to help you get rid of them. In his first apology, he is now not speaking to the vast majority of Greeks, as he did in his discourse to the Greeks, but specifically to the Roman emperor, to Titus. And he says to Titus, and also to his son, Verissimus, the philosopher, and to Lucius, the philosopher. Right Again, he's trying to address philosophers as a philosopher, as this basis for his apology. Right, He's giving a defense for what he believes. He's addressing those who love learning and the Senate and the whole people of the Romans. He says, I, Justin, the son of Priscus and grandson of Bacchius, natives of Flavia and Neapolis in Palestine, present this address and petition on behalf of those of all the nations who are unjustly hated and wantonly abused, myself being one of them. Right here, I'm going to try to defend what Christianity is, I myself being one of them, though I am of Greek origin. He's pointing that out too. In chapter two, he says, reason directs those who are truly pious and philosophical to honor and love only what it is true, declining to follow traditional opinions if these are worthless. And if you indeed want to be just and want to be wise, you want to be a true philosopher, you need to accept what's true and abandon what's worthless. That this is the aim, this is the scope. This is why Justin's really no different than we see with Socrates and Aristotle and Plato or Kant or Hegel or even Hume, right? They're all looking and endeavoring to do what they believe to be true off of what they can observe to be true. Chapter three, he lays out the claim of judicial investigation. He says, but lest anyone think that this is an unreasonable and reckless utterance, we demand that the charges against the Christians be investigated. But don't just hear something and go, I kind of don't like those people, let's get rid of them. Investigate the charges, due process, one of these bases of Western law is being advocated here by Justin. It says the subjects render an unexceptional account of their own life and doctrine, and that on the other hand, the rulers should give their decision in obedience, not to violence and to tyranny, but to piety and philosophy. If their lives look innocent and they're pious and they're wise, Right. Notice here, piety and philosophy are also somewhat equated. They're, they're walking hand in hand for just and martyr. Chapter four, he says that Christians are unjustly condemned for their mere name. For a philosophy too, some assume the name and the garb who do nothing worthy of their profession. There are some philosophers who call themselves a philosopher who don't produce anything. They don't live like a philosopher. And you were well aware that those of these ancients, whose opinions and teachings were quite diverse, and yet all are called by the same name, philosophers. Right? That there's a lot of different people who are given the same title, but we should understand that that doesn't mean that they're all the same. Right? Well, Christians are unjustly condemned by us by being called a Christian. Do you? Want to hold the charges against Dionysius, against Aristotle? Of course not. They're two different people who, while both being philosophers, and both, at least in some respects, being Athenians, though neither of which are from Athens originally, we would not want to treat them one at all at the same. They're radically different. Their crimes, their actions, if indeed they've committed any, are their own and their responsibility needs to be addressed by them. Next, he addresses that charge of atheism. He says, in our case, who pledge ourselves to do no wickedness nor to hold these atheistic opinions, you do not examine the charges made against us, but yielding to unreasonable passion. Right? Once again, who's the one who's being unreasonable? Who's not approaching things? He's saying it's you guys, you're, you're giving into your, your hatred, your passions and to the instigation of evil demons. 
you punish us without consideration or judgment, for the truth shall be spoken. For not only among the Greeks did reason, did logos, right, this, this word, which is also the name then given to Christ here in, in John, right, prevail to condemn these things through Socrates, but also among the barbarians were they condemned by reason or the word, the logos himself, right? These, these ideas, God is the act for who took shape and became man and was called Jesus Christ. And in obedience to him, we not only deny that they who did such things are these were gods, but assert that they are wicked and impious demons whose actions will not bear comparison with those even of men and uh, desirous of virtue. But many of the things that you're going to say, okay, you're calling us an atheist, right? But the, no, these are these are demons. These are you yielding to evil, to these temptations. You'll find even amongst our more pious men that they're they're better than these demons. And he continues in chapter 13, saying, "Our teacher of these things is Jesus Christ, who also was born for this purpose and was crucified under Pontius Pilate." the procreator of Judea in the times of Tiberius Caesar, and that we reasonably worship him, having learned that he is the son of the true God himself, and holding him in the second place, and the prophetic spirit in the third, we will prove, right? So here he's already outlining the basic tenets of the Trinity about the year 145 to 150-ish. Uh, right as he's beginning to write these and make this argument, we see this clear doctrine already expressed. Justin, being an apologist, is trying to examine and understand and explain the relationship between different schools of thought, between his worldview and the Romans that he's writing in his first apology. One of the things he does is he looks to the works of Plato, already being a student and scholar of Plato. He's trying to relate Plato then with the understandings that he has found within Christianity and how he sees this as a fulfillment of the works and understandings of Plato, let alone others. He mentions Plato, he says Plato in this place uh, mentions that he placed him crosswise in the universe. Now, what does this mean, this discussion about Plato saying something was placed crosswise in the universe, that there's a, a cross in the universe? Justin points out a commonly held belief at this time, one that most modern scholars find suspect at most, but was fairly commonly held during the time of Justin, and that is that Plato and Socrates and therefore also likely Aristotle, had read the works of Moses. There seems to be a temporal relation that this could have been done and wouldn't have been too difficult to do, that the Torah would have been written in some version forms, pieces, fragments, whatever, traveled to Athens, and some of this as gathered pieces of wisdom would have found its way into schools of thought. And this is one of the reasons why you could see a certain amount of overlap between the writings of Moses and the writings of Plato. It must be that Plato had encountered these writings of Moses. In fact, other arguments are even done also about the works of Homer drawing certain parallels and connections to this as well. Now, again, most scholars today believe that this is not the case, but Justin was relying on what was understood or at least perceived by many as a likely case of philosophical speculation and starts to draw connections based on this. Most notably, he points to the verses of Numbers 21.8. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the story of what's happening here in Numbers 21, it's said that the Israelites were wandering around in the desert and got attacked by a group of serpents, poisonous serpents. They're dying of poison, and Moses was commanded to take some bronze and to fashion it into the image of a serpent and to lift it up high. 
and that when people were to look upon the bronze serpent that they would be healed lots of discussions have been made about this and, and the typology of, of magic for instance that's being used Marcel Mose and others will address this and but the thought is what is it we're trying to do with this what is it we're perceiving out of this Justin ends up making an argument that when Plato was reading this encounter though likely Plato didn't he said that he didn't accurately understand and not apprehending that it was actually the figure of the cross but taking it to be a placing crosswise he said that the power is next to the first god was placed crosswise in the universe right he's making this connection by the way the the whole brass serpent being lifted up uh, is seen for justin and other christians as a typology of the cross the instrument of death and poison is actually the instrument of life and that this being lifted up and exalted and looked upon as what's going to give you life this is the reason why christians hold the symbol of the cross as powerful instead of running away from it it's lifted up uh, also making this connection to numbers uh, 21 8 this idea of the brass uh, serpent is put upon staffs held by bishops in Christianity and, and lifted up for the same way. This instrument of death is something that is actually going to be an instrument of life because God can make all things new, etc., etc. In the rest of this work, Justin continues by making an apology, an argument, a defense for the lived lives of Christians and what's being done in the church the ideas of the sacraments and what are they and how they're rational and not magical or profane or weird ideas of drunkenness and, and hiding off and all of these but are rational practices and he is trying to demonstrate them as reasonable to the Romans the first of which he addresses is an issue of baptism it says then they are brought by us where there is water and are regenerated in the same manner in which we ourselves were regenerated and this washing is called illumination because they who learn these things are illumined in their understanding and notice here there's a connection to being baptized and gaining knowledge gaining a perspective a cleansing but also an enlightenment illumination in chapter 61 you also see a very clear trinitarian formula laid out it says for christ also said unless you are born again you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven committed there are pronounced over him those who are choosing to be born again repenting of their sins in the name of the god the father and the lord of the universe and in the name of the holy ghost who through the prophets foretold and so you're being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Same basic formula that's done today. Following this, he continues in chapter 65, says, There is then brought to the president of the brethren bread and a cup of wine mixed with water. And he taking them gives praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and the Holy Ghost once again this basic Trinitarian formula and offers thanks at considerable length for our being counted worthy to receive these things from his hands this word amen also is used meaning so be it so he explains even this word that's being said in the middle of this this amen and what does this mean so be it indeed these these sorts of ideas being added on to it and this food what is this food again this bread and wine and water he said it's called among us the eucharist of which no one is allowed to partake but the man and women and children who believes that these things which we teach are true and who has been washed with the washing that is of the remission of sins and under regeneration who is so living as christ has enjoyed for not as common bread and not common drink do we receive this but in like manner as jesus christ our savior having been made flesh by the word of god as both flesh and blood for our salvation so likewise have we been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word and from which our blood and flesh by transmutation 
are nourished is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. So of the Eucharist, he says, okay, so it's bread and wine and water, but it's not bread, wine, and water. right? Not as common bread and not as common drink do we receive this, but as the body and blood of Christ, the doctrine of the real presence is affirmed here and explained how this is happening to the Romans as well. Continuing on in chapter 67, he addresses when this is done. It says, but Sunday is the day on which we hold our common assembly, because this is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness of, and matter, made the world. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day rose from the dead. That it is the first day of the week that this is going to be done. This is a special holding of all of this. This is the practice that's being done by those who are baptized, receiving the Eucharist. And he concludes in chapter 68. And if these things seem to you to be reasonable and true, honor them. But if they seem nonsensical, despise them as nonsense. And do not decree death against those who have done no wrong, as you would against enemies. And he goes back and at the very end, he says, okay, this is what we're doing. The mystery, as it were, is, is laid bare. Is this reasonable? I think it's reasonable. I've made an argument that it's reasonable. I've explained why we're doing what we're doing. And if you don't find it reasonable, is it immoral? Is it worthy of death? No, it's not. Therefore, leave us alone. And this is the argument that's being made at this point by Justin. This is what philosophy does. Let's engage in these ideas. Let's understand them more. If I find an idea worthy of ridicule or humiliation, let me understand it and then ridicule it and humiliate it. But that doesn't mean that the person who's saying it deserves death, deserves a punishment, even if it's an idea that I find abhorrent or laughable. It still needs to be engaged in the realm of philosophy, in the realm of ideas. Unless an act of violence is being done, there's no reason to respond with violence. In his second apology, he addresses this to the Roman Senate. And I'll just highlight a few things here, primarily chapters 10 and 15. Chapter 10, he says, our doctrines then appear to be greater than all the human teachings because Christ who appeared for our sakes became the whole rational being, both body and reason and soul. And Socrates, who was more zealous in this direction than all of them, was accused of the very same crimes as ourselves. And he's making a, an equation between Socrates and early Christians, right? Socrates was being attacked for made up charges, etc., and, and corrupting the youth and not believing in some of the gods. Well, that's the same thing that we're being charged with, right? For no one trusted in Socrates so as to die for his doctrine, but in Christ, who is partially known even by Socrates. Now, I know immediately you're going to quick pause here. What are you talking about, Justin? How is Christ known by Socrates? Christ lived after Socrates, etc. He says, but he, Christ, was and is the word who in every man and who foretold the things that were to come to pass, both through the prophets and in his own person, when he was made of like passions and taught these things, right? That here, Christ is the word of God and found in everyone and is wisdom. Therefore, he was known at least in part by Socrates. Not only philosophers and scholars believed, but also artisans and people entirely uneducated, despising both glory and fear and death, since he is a power of the ineffable Father, not the mere instrument of human reason. Chapter 15, he says, And our doctrines are not shameful according to his sober judgment, but are indeed more lofty than all human philosophy. And would that you also, in manner being becoming piety and philosophy, would for your own sakes judge justly. In other words, hey, Senate, what we're teaching isn't so crazy. It's basic philosophy. 
It's about following after the wisdom and truth and has been taken on by philosophers, but also other people, other scholars, artisans, and the mass of humanity are all taking on this doctrine, this idea. And there's power in it, but it's not just an instrument of reason, but there's more to this. This is a philosophy of life and the philosophy of life, according to Justin Martyr. In other words, Justin concludes throughout his apologies and his dialogues that Christianity is true because it's reasonable. It's philosophy, it's true love of wisdom because true wisdom is found in Christ and therefore true Christianity and true philosophy are one and the same, that they're wedded together. It should come as no surprise that throughout the medieval era, let alone afterwards, that there is this union of what it is to be Christian is what it is to be reasonable. That there's this argument that Christianity is understood through philosophy as a science. That the mysteries are mysteries, but they're not things that are irrational mysteries. They're rational ones. That you shouldn't expect to know everything, but that doesn't mean that it's contradictory in any way. This is the argument that's being made by Justin. And again, we'll see this wedded throughout the patristic medieval and modern era that Christianity is using philosophy as a tool of understanding itself and helping you to understand yourself.